Psalms 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord with all your heart and tell of the story of his wonderful deeds. We want to give him thanks. We want to praise him this morning. Let's stand together and sing. Count your many blessings. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Man, man, oh man, when, uh, when God is at work in our lives, are we blessed? We are blessed. We are blessed beyond word, are we not? Amen? Oh, amen. Thanks be to God. Listen to what the psalmist says about giving thanks to Him. Psalm 8, 118, the psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, we're thankful because God's good. And we're thankful because he is steadfast in loving us. And he just loves us and loves us. And it endures forever. Thanks be to God. Hey, welcome. Let's pray and commit our morning to him. God, you're a great God. You're mighty and good in everything you do. And God, we are in awe of your, of your goodness toward us, of your steadfast love, of your faithfulness. That God, you would... You would grant us fresh mercy every day. You would shower us in your grace. That God, you would bestow your presence in our lives. You would manifest through our life your joy. That God, you would allow us to walk in, in a peace that is beyond comprehension. God, you are good and we love you. And we thank you and praise you this day for your bounty and blessing in our lives. And Father, this day as we gather in your presence, it's with hungry hearts that we gather because, God, we want to encounter you. We want to meet with you, God. We want to have a holy encounter with you that, that is transformative in, in our life and in our way and in our walk. And so, God, it's our prayer that you would speak into our lives, 
The God, you would speak so clearly and so unmistakably that, Father, we might know we've been in your presence, and God, as a result, that we might be a people changed. God, we just commit the whole of the moment to you and pray that, God, your anointing would rest on every element of our shared time, and we will praise and thank you, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated as we worship together. Let's sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortality. about our children up front for children's message. guys. I'm glad to see you. Have any of you had Thanksgiving dinner yet? That, that's okay. Some, I, 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 I have seen, I've heard of a few people that have it early, but when do we usually have Thanksgiving dinner? And when is that? No, we're getting close. One more day, Thursday. Come, this coming Thursday, we have Thanksgiving. And why in the world do we have Thanksgiving? Well, it's a good reminder to stop and give God thanks. 
to give God thanks for all that he has done for us and to provide. And, and we, we as Christians should want to have that heart and, and do that all the days of our lives. But it's good to have a, a reminder. And so, so years and years ago, um, the president made it a day. And then so we, we, we have Thanksgiving Day and we celebrate um, on, that, on Thursday, and we will get together with family and friends. A lot of us will, maybe not all of us, but some of us will, and we will celebrate and be, be together as family and hopefully give thanks. So we're looking at having a thankful heart today, and God reminded us to have a thankful heart. And I started looking at the different characters that, that gave thanks to God, and, and most of them did. Um, but I'm going to give you kind of an unusual one, and I want you to he hear her story and then see if you can figure out how she gave thanks. Uh, the, this is the story of Hannah. Does anybody know the story of Hannah? Well, don't tell it because I want to tell it, all right? You can tell it to somebody else later. Or you can tell me afterwards. But here's the story of Hannah found in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2. And Hannah is married to Elkanah or Elkanah. Um, and he is, they are married and they don't have children together. Hannah is not able to have a baby. And this makes her very sad. Very, very sad. She really wants to be a mother. She really wants God to bless her with a baby. And so she prays and prays. So every year, um, Elkanah and Hannah go to um, the temple. And as they go to the temple, they give their worship and praise. They bring their sacrifices and, and sacrifice for their sins at the temple. And they give honor to God. And they do this year after year. And one year, Hannah is there, and she is praying, and she's pouring out her heart. In fact, she's not just praying, you know, when we pray and, and when we have one person pray, but everybody else kind of prays in their head. She wasn't even praying quietly. She was, she was, the scripture said she was speaking the words, and she was talking to God. And the priest was just outside the door. And he was there listening. His name was Eli, and he was listening, and he got kind of concerned about Hannah. So he went in and checked on Hannah and asked if everything was okay. And Hannah said, oh, yes, yes, I, I am just deeply praying and asking God. And she started telling the story about how she really wanted to have a son. She wanted to have a baby. And she was telling all about this and how she was praying to God, and she made a promise to God. Whoa, she made a promise to God that if she got a baby boy, a son, that she would give that boy back to God. Okay, so that's how the story goes. So Eli tells her, well, may you be blessed and, and may it be so within a year you will have a baby boy. And guess what? Within the year she has a baby boy. She's not able to go to the temple. The, um, her husband asks her if she wants to go, and she goes, no, the time is not right yet. I'm still taking care of the baby and doing things. And she did that for a couple of years. And then eventually, she went back to the temple, and she took her son, Samuel, who was born to her, her son, and she took him to the temple to give him back to the Lord. And her plan was, was to give him so that he could work and be at the temple, and he would stay there instead of staying in their home. And some Bible scholars have studied this, and they think that, that Samuel may have been as young as three years old. Can you imagine your mom dropping you off somewhere, at, bringing you to the church and leaving you, in charge, uh, leaving you with Pastor Paul at age three? <laughs> no, that would be, wouldn't that be crazy or what? Maybe in a moment when you're not obeying, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But no, or, and, and then other scholars say, well, if you look at it enough and figure out the timing, he may have been more like maybe eight, nine, or ten. So that might be a little bit better, but still, she leaves him at the temple to live and do God's work because she made a promise and she kept her promise to God. And God blessed her and watched over her. And so, did you hear anything about thanks? Not much yet, all right? So then, in chapter 2, we read Hannah's prayer. as She has given Samuel... Oh, let me show you a picture. Maybe that'll help you. Here's the baby. Where's the baby born? All right? And then this is Eli, the priest, with the boy 
giving up. Now, these are just an artist's idea of what happened. We don't know exactly how this happened. But she's giving um, Samuel to Eli. And so then all this happens, and then she starts praying. And if you read in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, this is her prayer. She starts talking about her prayer. The first thing she does is she gives worship to God and says, God, you are the only one, and worships him and exalts his name. Then in her prayer, she says, God, you are holy. There is no one else like you, God. You are God and the one and only God. In fact, let me read that scripture to you. It's in verse chapter 2, verse 2, and it says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Then she goes on to say, God, you are all-knowing, and you are in control of every situation, and you take care of all things. And then she prays and says, God, you bring protection and care to all of your people. And gives, gives God, talks about his protection and his care. And then she closes her prayer with that God is the judge. And God is the one who makes judgment on all people and shows how powerful God is. And so how in the world do we get that Hannah had a thankful heart out of that prayer? Because nowhere in there did she say, thanks be to God. Or nowhere did she sing, Give thanks with a grateful heart, which is what we're going to sing here in a minute. She didn't sing the song. It didn't say in the scripture anyway. But we can tell how she gave thanks by what she did. She didn't say, God, this is my boy that you have blessed me with. Take care of him. And, be, and she, was, she wasn't about herself or him. She was about God. She was talking about how holy he was, how wonderful he was, and that she was willing to give him back up because she was thankful for the gift God gave to her. Wow, I cannot even understand that heart. And I hope that someday I get a little bit of that heart, a little bit more, where I can say, God, I, I, want, I want it to be all about you. But so many times when I pray, I say, God, please help my friends, and please help my kids, and please watch over my family, instead of showing God how thankful I am by showing him how great he is, showing him how wonderful he is. God is amazing. God is wonderful. So this Thanksgiving, let's be challenged to demonstrate how thankful we are by giving God praise and worship. May we be willing to sing God's praise. May we be willing to, re to share his scripture and tell about God. May we give God the honor and praise that he is due and make it all about him. Wow, I, I, I don't know all of the story. We don't know all of the story of Hannah, but we know what's written in the Bible and what an amazing story that Hannah gave up Samuel and gave God thanks and praise. Now, it, I think there's other passages that show that Samuel and Elkanah um, came and visited um, Samuel all of his life, all of their lives, and, and spent time with him. So they didn't just desert him, and they took care of him too. But, but he, got to, he got to be part of working with God and loving God, and it's all about God. So this Thanksgiving, let's make it all about God. Let's show our love to others because we love God, okay? So let's ask God to help us. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray that we would remember to have a thankful heart. We would remember that you are holy, that you are no one else is like you, God. You are the one true God. That, Lord, you, you are amazing. You are in control. And, Lord, you have everything Everything is in your care and protection. So we trust you. We walk with you today, God. We want to worship you. I pray that as our boys and girls get ready to go back to their seat and then off to children's worship in a little while, that wherever they go, whatever they do, they would worship and honor you. So that all of this week, when we give thanks, when maybe we're sitting around the Thanksgiving table enjoying food, we can give thanks and tell how awesome our God is and share some of the stories about how awesome you are. And may we be reminded to have a thankful heart all the days of our lives. We pray that you're, for your help this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, you can get a piece of candy on your way back to your seat. Thank you for listening today. people of thanksgiving. May we give our worship and praise. Let's stand and honor him this morning as we sing, Give Thanks to the Lord. Give 
seated. Our boys and girls, four-year-olds through first graders are dismissed for children's worship at this time. And Macy's going to come down and share a message and stuff. Good morning. What a story you have written. The unworthy would be saved. You have said that it is finished. There is no more death to pay. Oh, what love have you shown a sky that you would send to your son in our place? And oh, what grace have you? Display you are worthy of all our praise. You're worthy of our praise. How bound we were to darkness. How hopeless in our state At the cross you have pardoned That deep and deathly fate Oh, what love have you shown a sky That you would send to your son in our place have you displayed you are worthy of all our praise you're worthy of our praise you're worthy of our praise so we sing holy Thank you, Macy. What great words and what great, uh, what great direction for our thoughts. Praise be to God. Thank you, sister. Thanks for ministering to us in song. Thank you. Hey, uh, as, uh, as we uh, prepare to hear the word, uh, let, let me invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 17. Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 17. We're going to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving, but I do want to, I do want to uh, uh, give a disclaimer. Uh, you, hey, if you want to bring your three-year-old and drop it off at the church for Pastor Paul... I'll take all comers. You just need to know this. When they come, they're not going back. They're at my house. They're staying at my house. Uh, <clears throat> and they may stay at my house past 18. I don't know, but uh, they're staying at my house. And uh, they are welcome, and you just bring them, and it would be a thrill 
and a joy to, to us. Hey, as we talk about Thanksgiving, as we begin to think about Thanksgiving... The Psalms are full of thanksgiving because an element of worship for the, the people of God is this heart of thankfulness. Not that God does anything out of, our, out of demanding our thankfulness, but that God out of His character moves in our lives. And if our, if our heart and if our life is to be a, aligned with God and is to be right, then we will birth a thankful heart. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He began writing out some bullets about some things that were imperative. Verse 17, he said, pray without ceasing. Part of the element of what we are to do as believers is to be continually and, and persistently in prayer. But in verse 18, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, he said, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. That's, that's what he said. I love what he spoke to us about in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about some th way, things about our walk. Uh, he ta told us that we're to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. And in verses 15 through 21 of that fifth chapter, he said that we are to walk in wisdom. And by walking in wisdom, we're filled with the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit of God. Every believer should walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Every day we should be filled with the Spirit because we have a leakage problem, so you got to do that every day. You've got to ex experience the fullness, the infilling of the Spirit of God on a daily basis. And then in verses 18 through 21 of that, that text, the Apostle Paul said there are four things that happen in, in people's lives who will walk filled with the Spirit. And they are four participial phrases that are modifiers of what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. That is evidence of being filled with the Spirit. He says people who are filled with the Spirit, they speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Number two, they sing and they make melody in their hearts to the Lord. They're just, they're just full of, full of uh, praise and adoration of their good, the goodness of their God. They sing and they make melody in their hearts to the Lord. Number three, they give thanks for everything through Christ Jesus our Lord. They are thankful. Number four, they're subject to one another. We are, in account of, we are accountable and we are in discipleship relationships if we're filled with the Spirit. We're thankful. We're thankful. We're going to talk about thankful, being thankful and birthing a thankful spirit, a thankful heart today. Uh, here in Luke chapter 17. Uh, I love the story about Ed Spencer. Ed Spencer was a college student. He was on the swim team at Northwestern uh, when all of a sudden there was a shipwreck on Lake Michigan many, many years ago uh, in more primitive days than we experienced. And there were many lives lost on that shipwreck and uh, that, uh, that on the shipping lanes there in, on Lake Michigan. And uh, Ed, Ed Spencer ran to the shore and he began to pluck people out of the water. He began to swim out and bring people back to safety. And that day he saved 17 people. He drug 17 people back to safety. It was a, a notable thing, made the headlines. It was uh, an incredible thing. Years later, as they were uh, reviewing that, that day and memorializing the many lives that were lost and celebrating the lives that were saved, they interviewed Ed Spencer. And they asked Ed if there, was a, if there was something of note that he remembered about that day, if there was something that was significant in light of that day. And it was an intriguing thing. He said this, he said this. Well, it, it's kind of interesting to me that of those 17 people, not a single one has come back to say, thank you. Luke chapter 17, verse 11, follow along with me. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, then, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. 
What an incredible story. What an incredible moment out of our, our gospel text. What an incredible moment. Here, here we see the blessing of God poured out into our lives and this blessing that is beyond, uh, beyond our ability, to, I think, in our day and our experience to comprehend the, the incredible blessing that was poured out on these ten lives. Here we meet a, a problem that's great. A problem that's great. There met him on the way as he was traveling. There met him on the way ten lepers. They were outcasts. They were lepers. They were alienated from their family. They were lepers. They were alienated from every friend they knew. They were lepers. They were alienated from their faith. They could not come to temple. They could not observe any of the religious practices. They could not do the many things that, that other people would perceive as being able to be in, in uh, communion with God because they were lepers. They were lepers. In uh, Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45, the the Old Testament tells us that uh, the lepers were to stay at a distance from everyone. And when anyone approached them, they were to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that no one would approach and no one would be. And they were to carry a bell. Now that's a cowbell. It's supposed to tell you where a cow is. But for the leper, it told you where not to be. It told you that you weren't supposed to approach them and they weren't to approach you and they were to be alienated from everything that was significant in, in this world. We find four lepers in 2 second, second Kings chapter 7, verse 3. In 2 Kings chapter 7, there were four lepers and they were outside the city gates at Jerusalem when Jerusalem was besieged and they were outside the gates. They were not welcomed in Jerusalem. They were not welcomed in the city. They were not welcomed in community. They were not welcomed in relationships. They were forfeit. They had to forfeit everything that life had afforded them. The problem was great. They were to cry out while they were a long, long way off unclean and no one was to approach. They've lost everything. They've lost their livelihoods. They've lost their dreams, they've lost their hopes, and they were living a slow death. As little by little, they were seeing their lives, their health, their hopes, their dreams, everything that mattered in this world evaporate before them. Leprosy is something we don't normally see or don't normally understand in our culture in our day it's a it's a slow death of the of the sensory uh, uh, of the nerve nerve systems and uh, lepers as the leprosy progresses cut themselves don't know they're cut don't know if something happened and so so they get terrible infections and the progression of leprosy in this day would have been that you would first lose your fingers and toes and then you might lose a hand or a foot and then you might lose your ears and your nose and as, as it progressed you would walk walk about with limited limbs probably no nose and no ears unclean a pariah in this world these lepers had banded together. They had banded together out of desperation and they had banded together out of loneliness. They had somehow screwed up enough courage to hope that they could meet Jesus on the way. They heard Jesus was coming by and though it violated all of the law of their day, they approached and they came near that they might get a glimpse of Jesus and cry out to him. The scripture says they stood afar off. They stood at a distance. They stood afar off. They were far from their hope. They were far from everything. They were struggling to find some kind of, some kind of semblance of hope in their life. They stood afar in their dreams, in their yearning. But they were longing for what they had lost. And so they dared to draw near. They followed a great crowd that was encountering Christ and they were hoping for their change. They were hoping for their change. 137 years ago when I was in college, um, I had a dear friend named James. He was a, a student who wanted to be a preacher. But he was, he was, uh, he was a victim of... Uh, he had seizures that were grand mal seizures, very desperate seizures. Every time he would have a seizure, he would sleep about 24 hours to recover from that seizure. They were, they were, uh, they were 
They were brutal, they were life-changing, they, they were altering. But he was a great, great young man and a great friend. And uh, I'll never forget his, his favorite verse. He says, this is my life verse, Paul, this is my life verse. It's out of the book of Job, and he loved to read the book of Job and the move of God. And he said, this is my life verse. Job said, I'll wait for my change. My change comes from the Lord. And James, as he was struggling with a life-altering illness that medication could not get under control, that was going to steal his life, said, I'm living on this. I'm waiting for my change. My change comes from God. Here were ten lepers. Their situation was desperate. And they were waiting for their change. And they knew on, their change could only come from God. They raised their voices and they made a pe petition. They cried out and they made a petition that was sincere. Their problem was great. Their petition was sincere. There was an urgency in this request they made. They lifted up their voices. They lifted up their voices. There was a cry of urgency here. They cried out because they wanted to be heard, but they cried out because they were desperate. Jesus, they were desperate. When the need is great, the cry must be great. Sometimes as we pray, I wonder if the need is great because our cry is not great. These lepers knew this. We have a problem that is great and so our cry must be urgent and they cried out to Christ. And if you've got a problem that's great and you desperately want to see God move, then maybe there should be some fasting and praying and setting aside some days and pulling apart from ordinary activity and devoting yourself to, to a, a petition and an intercession and saying, God, I'm not going to move from here. I'm not going to, nothing's going to happen. God, here I am until, until you move, until you work, and until you accomplish what you can do. Their cry was urgent. Their cry had a sense of, uh, of humility about it, of unworthiness even about it. Their cry was for mercy. Jesus, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. They cast themselves at His feet and surrender. Have mercy. They did not appeal to their godly walk, that we have been righteous. They did not appear, uh, appeal to their righteous acts of, uh, 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 of, of service. They did not appear to their, uh, appeal to their religious observances. They did not appeal to their keeping of the law. This is what they said, Jesus, we got nothing. Just have mercy. We want mercy when we have no recourse of our own. When we know that we're unmerited and the only hope we have is that people have mercy because we don't deserve anything, Jesus, have mercy. And there was an understanding in their request. They said, Jesus, you have authority and power to make things different. We're coming to you, Jesus, Master, Master. Everything happens at your command, Jesus, Master. Verse, thir verse 14, they, they beheld his mercy. He saw them. No one else ever saw them. No one else ever considered them. They were lepers. Everyone avoided them. They didn't make eye contact with them. You ever have those moments where you get uncomfortable? There's a situation, a circumstance that goes along on and, and you just think, well, I just, I just won't look. You ever have those moments? I'm a... I'm a, I'm a I'm a rural human. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a country guy out here. And so every once in a while I go to the city and make a hospital visit or something. You pull up and here is someone standing in the street corner with a cardboard sign. And they're right here in your window. If you get caught at the light right there, I try to time it so I'm not the guy right there. Don't laugh at me. You do the same thing. Come on. I don't want to be right there, but every once in a while I get right there. And here's this face, and I just think, what is that? That's kind of inhuman, isn't it? There's something wrong about that. I, I, I got to do something different. I, I, I've decided I, I, I'm going to start taking goodie bags with me when I go, because I'm not going to do something. But I, I can give away some goodie bags. I can hand them out some, some snacks. I, here, here you go. I don't know what that'll do, but I, it'll give me a little bit of peace and maybe I can look. 
No one looked, but Jesus saw them. Their need was great. And their cry was urgent. Jesus took note and changed them. The process was simple. The process was simple. Their need was great and their, 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 cry, their, their, their cry was urgent. And the process, it was simple. Jesus said, go show yourselves. Go show yourselves to the priest. Go show yourselves. And they took action and they went. And as they went, they were cleansed. God expects obedience and He moves in our lives in response to our obedience to Him. God honors obedience in our lives. It would have been illegal for them to present themselves to the priest being unclean. It would have been illegal for them to approach a priest being in the state of leprosy, but they obeyed. They just did what Jesus said. It wasn't a big, big dog deal. It wasn't a huge, uh, a huge scaling of the heights experience. They simply were obedient to what Jesus said and he moved in power. When we are simply obedient and do what God says, it's amazing how God takes little things and does great things. Years ago, years ago, there's a little bitty church, and they were trying to reach and touch and care for lives. And the pastor one day saw a little girl who was... Uh, can I... Uh, I don't... A, a poor girl. She was poor and didn't have many resources and didn't have many, much recourse. And there wasn't room for her in the church and she was crying and the pastor grabbed a hold of her, brought her in the church and they found room. But they were bursting. Little church, tiny church. They were bursting. But she found love there. And she found what she looked for there. She had a tough life and as a child uh, she, she died. This is uh, more than 100 years ago now, in the 1800s, but, but she died. And when they found her body in her bed in this hovel where they lived, there was a little red coin purse that she'd evidently pulled out of the trash somewhere. It was all busted up, but in it was 57 cents, 57 cents. And a note that said, this is for the church to build space so all boys and girls can meet Jesus. The story got out. The church was speaking to a realtor about a piece of property where they could expand. It cost thousands of dollars beyond what they could accomplish. And the realtor with a tenderness of heart said, I tell you what, I'll sell you this property for 57 cents. Today, that little church is a church with a seating capacity of 3,300 people called Temple Baptist Church. It is the place where that church founded a university called Temple University to train Christians in engaging their world. That church started a hospital and it started because of 57 cents. I don't know what God asks us. I don't know what he says to us. Sometimes we get a prompting, sometimes we get leadership, sometimes we get an urging and we think, oh, that won't make any difference. Oh, that doesn't matter. Oh. Jesus said, I want you to go show yourself to the priest. And they just did. And while they were on their way, they were cleansed. God moves through simple obedience. Here the need was great. Their cry was sincere and urgent. The process was simple. The power, it was amazing. They were cleansed. We serve a mighty God who can do, there's nothing our God cannot do. He, he is able. He has to tell me that over and over and over and over in my life. 
as a church family, there are some things we just practice. There, is, there are core things that this is just who we are. This is how we, this is how we roll. And, and this is the reality of how we function. When we make decisions, we try to do that in such a way that we are of one heart. Where, where this is what God wants us to do, that's what we're going to do. And sometimes we come to a meeting and we'll vote and we'll have a 75% vote on something. And, and you know what? <clears throat> according to, to all of our constitution, we can go ahead and do that. But uh, according to our practice, this is what we do. The pastor says, uh, we're going to table that for a month and we're just going to pray and try to hear God. Because you know what? It's not always the majority that hears, the, hears from God. Do you know that? So, so this is what we do. We just practice. We just practice. We're just going to pray until we pray through and get of one heart, and then, then we're going to follow God. That's what we're just going to do. And, and I have to continue to learn that. Here, here uh, just this past week, uh, a week ago, our, our deacons had been meeting, and uh, we'd been, I'd been meeting with our deacons. We'd been praying about a situation and talking about that the situation. We, in fact, we met four different times about it, just agonizing, and we had about this. And uh, I told staff, at staff, we were talking. I said, "You know what? The brothers are sweet-hearted and sweet-spirited. I, I think we're going to come to the to crunch time, and I, I, I don't see any way that we're just going to be of one heart. But uh, there won't be any conflict. We'll just agree uh, to to do what what." What we decide, I, I, I know that's what's going to happen, but, but I, I don't see any way any of this is going to change because, wow, uh, we are at polar opposites on some things here, and uh, we're just going to have to function and trust God to pick up pieces, I guess. I don't know how this is going to happen. And so, so we met a final time just before business meeting. What happened? We're of one heart. God speaks to us. How stupid am I? How many times do I have to learn that? How many times does God have to say, Hey, Paul, I'm big enough, buddy. Come on, if you'll just get out of the way, what is your problem, Paul? But I have to learn it over and over and over. Our God is big. He's amazing. His power is great. They're on their way, and they were healed. Sores closed feeling, return to limbs. Did they regrow noses and ears and fingers and toes? I don't know. I think they may have. Because Jesus healed them on the way. And when we, are, when we take our brokenness and take it to Jesus and enter through obedience's door, it's amazing what God can do. So their problem was great. Their, their cry was sincere and urgent. The process was very simple and the power of God was evidenced. And as a result, one returned. They were changed in their body. The cleansing came in an unexpected manner. You might have expected some great fanfare when you're cleansing a leper. That's a big dog deal. You might have expected the priest to form, perform some kind of, uh, of, of acts that would draw attention to himself, some great feat. Might have expected some formal actions. That would ha that's what happened in Naaman's day when he had to go dip in the Jordan seven times and he was cleansed from leprosy. Might have, I might have expected something like that, but it came in an unexpected way just while they were on the way. Suddenly, all of, all of a sudden, they looked down and they were cleansed. And they were whole. And their body was changed. And their outlook was changed. And their heart was transformed. And they were changed. And one responded in gratitude. That gratitude was spontaneous. Verse 15, he was not pushed or prompted to give thanks. He just saw what was going on and he gave thanks. In our homes we raise our children and we say this to our children. And what do we say? And our children say, thank you. Now I think that's okay. But you know what? No one had to prompt this leper. No one had to say, what is it we're going to say? He was healed, and in his heart, he wanted to go give thanks to the one who made a difference. It was spontaneous, verse 15. Verse 15, it was demonstrative. He came glorifying God with a loud voice. 
all who were anywhere around would know that God had done something and it was amazing in this leper's life. He was not embarrassed by gratitude. He came with a loud voice giving thanks to God. I wonder if there were tears of joy in that experience. If there were, I know this, he was unashamed. This past week, uh, every uh, uh, one night a week, uh, Becky and I uh, have our oldest granddaughter over and we, uh, we, watch, we watch movies and hang out together with our oldest granddaughter. We spend some time with our oldest granddaughter and have a big time. And we've been uh, reviewing some signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, we watch Hallmark stuff and, and have a great time. And we've been reviewing some signed, sealed, and delivered. And we watched a, a, a piece where there was this... Uh, a man from Afghanistan who, who, who was broken, this soldier from, who was in Afghanistan, who'd rescued a girl from the streets and took her to a cop helicopter, and she got out. But he was stranded there, and he got back and was done with his tour of duty and was, was injured, and he was broken. And he was on the streets, and he was broken. And it's a story of kind of restoration. And I've seen it three or four times, and we, we love that story, and it's a, it's a great moving story. And every time I see it, I'm sitting there this, this week, and I know what's coming. I've seen it three or four times. I know what's coming, and it, but it just, just poof, gears me. And, I, and I'm sitting here, and tears are rolling down my face, and I'm thinking, this is kind of not manly. What is the deal? And, and about that time, tears rolling down my face. Everybody wants to talk to me when tears are rolling down my face. <laughs> Don't you hate that? Yeah. I mean, you want tears to roll down your face, and they go on and talk, and you get over it, and you go on, and you can talk. But they always want to talk when you can't talk, and your voice is all broken up. It's because they don't love you, I think. <laughs> because I'm embarrassed and ashamed. Not this leper. He came with a loud voice to give thanks and praise to one who changed his world. He came humbly, verse 16, he fell at the feet of Jesus. He was sacrificial. He turned back. I'm sure there were many things that he could have done. I'm sure there are many things that screamed for his attention, time, and his heart. I'm sure that he longed to be with family and friends. I'm sure that he would long to go embrace his family that he had been so, so alienated from. But first, he had to give thanks, and he turned back. He determined to give thanks. It's a powerful thing. Thanks. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 107, verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Raise your voice. Give thanks. Thanks is powerful. Rudyard Kipling, uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, uh, acclaimed author, was encountered by some people who were, were talking to him about the, the folly of some aspects of writing and all this stuff. And they said, you know, we've done some, uh, some math, and uh, your books, your books and what they've, they've brought into your life, uh, equivalent, uh, the, the equivalent of that is you get $100 a word. $100 a word, Rudyard. Would you, would you, here's a $100 bill. Would you give me one of those $100 words? And he took that $100 bill, folded it up, put it in his pocket, and he said, Thanks. Thanks. It matters. Well, so the question for us today is, will, will we be of the thankful minority or will we be of the majority? Listen to Jesus' questions in this text. Were there not ten? Were there not ten? Where are the nine? Were there not found to give glory to God any more than this? Do we belong to the company of the one or the company of the nine? This company of one 
Jesus spoke to him and said to him an astounding statement. L listen to this statement. Jesus looked at him and he, he said this. He said, go your way. Do you know there are not many people Jesus says go your way to? A lot of people Jesus talks to them about what needs to be changed and what needs to be right, but he says go your way. Your faith has made you well. And it made all the difference. Thanks. He's 12 years old. His name was David. He was born with no immune system, and so he was put in a bubble at birth, and he lived his life in a bubble until he's 12. And at 12 years of age, he had a bone marrow transplant to give him an immune system. And they asked David, what is it that you want to do? What is it that matters to you? What is it you want to do if you get out of that bubble? And he said, if I get out of this bubble, I want to walk barefoot in grass. And I want to touch my mom's hand if I can ever get out of this bubble. Dear ones, we live in a bubble of sin. We're held in the penalty and power of sin. Our lives are shut up to it. And apart from a Savior, we're in this bubble of sin. Uh, it, it has power over us. It takes us places we don't want to go. It keeps us there longer than we want to stay. It causes us to do things we don't want to do. That's what sin is. That's the sin nature. That's where we live. That's who we are. But praise be to God. There's a Savior who laid down his life a ransom for you and me that I could be redeemed and restored to God that I could be set free from the penalty and the power of sin and that I could have a life that God designed for me what a wonder and I don't know about you but I We'll give thanks. Our musician's going to come. We're going to sing our hymn of decision. It is a miracle of grace. It's a miracle of God when He speaks to our hearts and our lives. Perhaps today the Spirit of God has spoken to you of your need of a Savior. So I would invite you to respond to Him. It, perhaps today He's spoken to you of, of your need of community. If you would like to be a part of the fellowship here at Laura Street and join our congregation, we would invite you to come. That begins by stepping forward, making your way forward, uh, declaring that that intention to the body that we might begin a covenant relationship together. There's something else on your heart. You want to have a time of prayer. There's the altar's open. You want someone to pray with you. We would gladly receive you. As we stand, as we sing, as the Spirit of God speaks, would you come today? I have decided Speak. 